often asked by people who have an image of Playboy from 15 years ago of a naked woman smiling in a cornfield, and that's what they're thinking of. Which, by the way, is bad enough because it commodified and sexualized women. But pornography today is absolutely unrecognizable to what it was a generation ago. And that's because of the internet. And the internet made pornography affordable and accessible, and anonymous, of course, which are the three things that really drive the market. So what's happened is you've increasingly now got a bigger, bigger consumer base. The average age of first viewing pornography studies show is 11 years old. Yeah, so what happens is you've got lots of men and boys viewing lots of pornography. Because just think about it a generation ago. You know, a, 14-year-old boy, hormones raging, wants to look at pornography, would have to go and find his father's playboy and would have limited access to these images. Now think about it today. Complete access 24-7. And the images that have, ha that have changed basically the face of pornography is no longer do you see softcore pornography in the business. In fact, softcore pornography has migrated into pop culture. What you're left with on the internet, if you type porn into Google, is body punishing, cruel, abusive, violent sex, which basically the images would not look out of place on an Amnesty International website. What you're seeing is sexual cruelty. And I don't know if I should describe some of these things. I mean, what do people? We get it. Well, you probably don't, actually. The truth is, is that people think they know what it is, but until you've seen it, your imagination cannot and begin to imagine what's going on. And I'll just give you an example, I'll give an example. One of the, two examples, one of the main things now in virtually all pornography is gagging, where the man puts his penis so far down the throat that she gags often to vomiting, and that's now throughout the pornography. The second thing that's very powerful is what's called ATM, ass to mouth. What they do is they put the penis into her anus and then straight into her mouth without washing. And what they're finding now is that women are having fecal bacterial infections in their throat. This is something new. So, I mean, it's that level of debasement and dehumanization because sex in pornography is designed to debase and dehumanize. And indeed, the more you can debase, the greater the sizzle. So, we need to be worried about it because we're bringing up a generation of boys as sexual sadists. Hmm. Um. Yeah, I would like to go into the question of what it means for boys and men to grow up in this, this world, what that, what that means. But there's actually another direction I'd like to go for just a second, which is one of the uh, sort of you know, central ideas of the spectacle is it always has to get worse because there's no emotional involved. We saw it with the Colosseum in Rome, and mm -hmm. we certainly see it today. And then, in addition, one of the critiques, one of the anti-porn critiques I've seen a lot is that is how something will become uh, move from oh, what was the Doobie Brothers album? Uh, what were once vices are now habits. Yeah, yeah. Um, so stuff can get increasingly mainstreamized, and <coughs> I want to bring this up because just this last week, I'd never seen it before. I saw about ten minutes of the movie Hostel Two, oh, cool. and um, in this scene, the, the, there was those. There was basically one, I saw a couple scenes, but the, the one, the first scene I saw, I'd never seen Hostel 1, I didn't, I, mean, I knew it was some nasty horror flick, but mm -hmm. I didn't know what. Mm -hmm. And the scene was of a woman being held over, she was tied upside down over a bathtub, another naked, another naked woman was in the bathtub, and the, the woman was bleeding, the woman to take a bath in her blood. And I was thinking that 30, or 40 years ago, this would presumably have been considered pretty outrageous, mm -hmm. even for hard, hardcore mm -hmm. pornography. Mm -hmm. And now this is a major money-making film. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, and I, I don't know if you want to comment on that. <laughs> well, I think that's what's key to all of this, is the desensitization. And it's both desensitization of the individual and desensitization of the culture. Because what we can tolerate now as a culture <coughs> is completely different to what it was a generation ago. And indeed, what you know, study after study shows is that the more violence in pornography that men actually see, the greater the need for increased levels <coughs> of violence. And this is what the pornography, you know, this didn't happen by accident. It did, you know, men do not wake up one day and think, I want to watch a woman being gagged, that sounds good. What the pornographers do, together with their ilk in um, pop culture, is they socialize men into this. You know, 
taste in terms of media is socialized. It's not something inherent. And what we have done in our culture is we have basically socialized, especially in men, a taste for really violent stuff. And these movies like Hostel are a, you know, precursor to going into the porn world as is um you know grand theft auto i don't know if people are familiar with this that was the biggest selling <coughs> um, video game ever and in that game you get points for killing prostitutes that's what you get extra points for and you kill them in the most vile hateful ways imaginable so just imagine this you're brought up on a steady diet of hostel to all of those movies you brought up on grand theft auto you brought up on mtv what are you going to want for your pornography you know, what are you going to need for something to give you an even bigger jolt in the arm? That's why Playboy is going bankrupt. The magazine is going bankrupt, baby. The only thing that Playboy can manage to make money on now is its branding. Everything else, and Penthouse went bankrupt years ago. Um, Hustler's only staying in business because of its websites. So what used to be pornography, Playboy, Penthouse, Hustler, the holy, unholy trinity of the three, basically no longer exists. Because it, who wants it? And so now let's go to this. What does this mean for men and boys to uh, grow up in this world saturated with pornography? Well, let's think. First of all, for most boys, I would say pornography today is the major form of sex education. Right? It doesn't exist really outside of that. Plus, it is the most powerful form of sex education because pornography sends men messages to men's brain via the penis, which is an incredibly powerful delivery system mm -hmm. in a way that nothing else sends that message. Mm -hmm. So what it means is that you become habituated to images of debasement and dehumanization and the more habituated you become, the more you internalize those images. And what I have found in my interviews with men and what studies have found is that, first of all, they internalize the porn world image. They think this is what people are doing. And there was a study done um, at NYU, and they said to men, um, what's the one sex act you've never done that you would love to do? And this was NYU students. And 80% said, ejaculate on the woman's face. Now, where would you get that from? That's straight out of pornography. Nobody thinks that up of them by themselves. So what men are increasingly doing is they're having porn sex now with their girlfriends. And, and <coughs> much to my sadness, a lot of the women are capitulating. You know, they're no longer negotiating men. They're capitulating to them. The other thing that happens is that pornography is industrial strength sex. It's the industrialization and commodification of sex. You get used to masturbating to that level of imagery. Sex with a real human being doesn't cut it. I've had many men tell me how they're disinterested in sex with their girlfriends. One guy told me how when he has, he has to have sex with his girlfriend, but he tries to do it as quickly as possible so she'll leave so he can go to the pornography. So these are the kinds of stories they hear. So they, another thing they tell me is that to, in order to ejaculate, they have to pull up the images from pornography because they're not interested in their girlfriends. Also, studies show that the more they use pornography, the less um, they say their girlfriends have got a good body, the less they're interested in any re committed relationship. And how this has really filtered down into the college campuses today is in the hookup sex culture. <coughs> I mean, studies are showing that there's increasingly no dating going on in campuses, and I can see you nodding on it from a campus, you know, but somebody from that age, and that's um, the hookup sex, where basically the key to hookup sex is that you can do anything from kissing to intercourse, but the issue is nobody expects a relationship. And again, what the studies have shown is women do hook up sex because they hope a relationship's going to come of it. But they don't know any other entree into getting a guy. Of course, the relationship doesn't come of it. So what is hook up sex? It's porn sex. It's sex with no connection, no intimacy, no feelings, no emotions one associates with love. It's just basically, you know, what they do in pornography. So that's what it means. It means internalizing the value system of pornography. Well, a, a couple things. One is I want to go to what it means for girls and women, but then there's another image that that you mentioned that um, about men bringing up images of pornography, and um, I guess now would be a good time to mention the book. I was going to mention this anyway, but they didn't get her books out there, but you can buy her books on her website or Amazon. Um, and the reason I'm bringing up the book right now is because you mentioned here. I just, it's almost one of those laugh out loud absurd moments that Hugh Hefner, um, according to one of his ex girlfriends, uh, will um, penetrate various women but can only ejaculate to porn, mm -hmm. which kind of 
says it all. I mean, yeah, it's like that's 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 sort of kind of messes with the whole Playboy idea. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's that's just, that's what she tells this young woman that he would line up the women, his girlfriends, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with the the girls next door and the entertainment. I don't imagine this is a crowd that watches that. Um, this is basically a glamorization of his life with working class. 18 year old girl so here's an 80 odd year old man who's got three only three girlfriends going at once and what she says they do is the sort of entree into his life is you have to have sex with him so the three women line up in the bedroom and they say sometimes they literally have to push her forward because she doesn't want to do he then push a, he coats himself in baby oil and then he has sex with each woman one after the other and they said the baby oil causes all sorts of vaginal infections but he keeps doing it no protection either and then they say when he's done after penetrating all three he then sends them away turns on the pornography and masturbates to ejaculation and that's the only way he can do it which tells you about the porn culture you know but playboy you know was crucial um, and I think, really, we'd always say there's always been pornography, so what's new? Well, the truth is, pornography started in 1953 with the first edition of Playboy. Why? Because it was the first time it became an industry. It was the first time porn images were circulated through the channels of mainstream American capitalism. Now, imagine this. How is it possible that in 1953, probably the most conservative decade of the century, Playboy becomes an overnight success. Well, to understand this, you have to understand what um, basically capitalist America needed after the Second World War. Europe was in ruins. They wanted to build this country up as a major superpower, but you had a problem. To build a superpower up, you needed people to spend money. And in order to spend money, people needed to do it on credit. But you were looking at a generation of men and women who were brought up during the war and brought up during a depression. These were frugal people. So in comes the media industry, and it's no accident the 1950s saw the massive expansion of televisions. Because think about the middle class, the emerging middle class, they lived in tenement blocks, in multi-family homes, suddenly they were moved to the suburbs. They didn't even know how to furnish a house in the suburbs. And I know it sounds ridiculous to say that people didn't know how to consume, but it was true in the 50s, they didn't know. So they brought the sitcoms in, and if you notice in a sitcom, you get to see all the rooms in a house, which was a way to train the women what to buy. Also, by the way, one of the reasons the ranch house was developed was because um, homes only had one TV, and they wanted the women to watch the TV, but she was often in the kitchen, so they developed a house whereby you could see from the kitchen into the living room and that was one of the reasons they came up with the ranch house this is how well organized all of this was anyway so you had the women and you had you know leave it to beaver and all of these sitcoms which the women were mainly watching how did you train men to become consumers and this is where Hefner hit on the brilliant idea basically the message in Playboy is this if you consume to the level that we tell you to consume then you will get the real prize, which is the women in the magazine, or women who look like the magazine. Because remember he kept saying the girl next door? Does anyone remember that? Crucial, because you had to make the reader believe that he could get girls like this, that they were real. So in the first editions of Playboy, there's very, very few images of women. But there is a four-page article on what I spoke it about. You know, there's an article on what suit to wear, on what desk to buy. It's all about how to buy products. So what Hefner did that was brilliant, he didn't just commodify sexuality. He sexualized commodities. And that's the best way to sell things. And then once, once the advertisers realized that this was a place where young, upwardly mobile white men were going, they were flooding to get into Playboy. Now, Playboy ran the roost until 1969 in the Chicago Tribune. There was a full page ad of a bunny in the rifle, crosshairs of a rifle. And underneath it says, we're going bunny hunting. This was the ad for Penthouse. And between 1969 and 1973, there was a war between Penthouse and Playboy to see who could create the most extreme, well, not extremely explicit imagery. Now, what's interesting is that Penthouse won the battle, but Playboy won the war. Why? Because Penthouse became so explicit that all the advertisers left Penthouse and ran back to Playboy. Now, the crucial thing about that war between 1969 and 1973 was it opened up the cultural avenues for what was acceptable <coughs> pornography to be mainstreamed. And it's no accident that in 1973, a strip club owner from Ohio started Hustler magazine. Mm -hmm. They opened up Playboy and Penthouse, laid the, laid the groundwork for Hustler. Those three magazines laid the cultural, economic, and legal groundwork now for the present day uh, $96 billion a year industry. So what we need to realize is that from its very beginning as an industry, Playboy was 
totally folded in to the dictates of American capitalism. And people often say to me, well, isn't pornography fantasy? You know, hello, fantasy happens in the head. Pornography happens into the international banks of capital. That's not fantasy. That's reality. That's economics. That's where this happens. So um, I've forgotten completely what your question was, but that's <laughs> an answer. <laughs> um, well, uh, we have a conundrum because that leads right into the next question of um, how else does pornography intersect with the other capital industries. But there's something I want to hit, go back to, which I think is also very important, which is um, what does it mean for girls and women? Yeah to be, because we, we talked about men, um, and we should also at some point probably also mention that, that boys are abused. Yeah, I mean those are the missing victims, right, the level of violence against young boys. And what you find, you know, and, and violence done to young boys is done by men, right, very few women sexually assault boys. And in pornography now, you know, they say that the sexualization of boys and girls in child pornography is 50-50. So there's not, it's very similar. So yes, I would like to say that absolutely boys are sexually abused as, as well. And, um, no and they're both inferior others, they're both feminized. essentially feminized. Yes, that's what you do to a little boy, you feminize them. Um, and then, but that's, and as they say, a lot of pedophiles will rape a boy or a girl until puberty. They're, they're, they're equal opportunity abusers, basically. Um, now, in terms of what it means for girls, right? Um, just imagine what it is like today to grow up in a world where your role model is Brittany, Paris, and Lindsay. And you should all know who their last names are, and I'm not going to say it because it's your fault. You obviously don't read People magazine if you don't know what their last names are. <laughs> now imagine what that's like to live in this world, this hyper-sexualized image. Now, when you are an adolescent, what you do is you build your gender and your sexual identity. And the way you build that identity is you wander through the culture looking for cues on what it means to be male, what it means to be female. Now, as an adolescent girl, the only cues you have coming at you basically is the Paris Hilton image. You look through Cosmopolitan, you turn on MTV, you listen, you watch YouTube with Britney Spears, and what you see is this constant hypersexualized image. Now, the problem with this is that when you want to define your femininity or who you are as a woman, that is your only image. And think if for a minute for that girl who doesn't want to take that image on. Think what it means when your friend has got these low slung jeans, the tramp stamp, the tramp stamp is what they call the um, tattoo on the back which we wear with the thong so that when you bend down you can see the tattoo. You've got the pierced belly button, you've got the low, the low top. What's going to happen if you choose not to look like that? Because in reality, and I'm, I'm going to put this crudely, women in patriarchy are basically divided into two. You're either fuckable or you're invisible. And you tell me what adolescent girl wants to be invisible. And so what you have now is young girls being bullied into conforming to a hypersexualized image because if your friend's doing it you better do it if you want to be noticed because no guy is going to look at you if you're not looking hypersexualized so what I'm arguing is that the culture has now become a collective perpetrator we have a perp culture and just like we used to have an individual rapist or pedophile who would groom the individual boy or girl <coughs> what you now have is an entire culture grooming an entire generation of girls to basically give men what they want sexually. Now, um, what's interesting, and I'll tell you how, what got me thinking on this, I interviewed seven men in prison, all of whom were in for raping a child and downloading child pornography. I have to say not one of them was a pedophile. Now, can you get your head around that? They raped children, but they weren't pedophiles. This is what's new. What they're finding increasingly is that men who prefer sex with adult women are getting bored with pornography with, of adult women, and they're trying children for a change. That's all it is. Right? They've never been pedophiles before in their life. They've never gone after a child. These all men were in their 40s, weren't they? Leah was with me, yeah. And you know, one of them said to me, he looked at me, and this is a guy who done lots of therapy, so he had the lingo down pat, and he said, the culture groomed my 10-year-old daughter for me. And he was right. He was absolutely right. You know, he never read anything in women's studies or media studies. He got it completely right, though. And so the culture is now perpetrating against these girls. There's a study by the American Psychological Association that shows that the more hypersexualized a girl is, the more she has um, suicidality, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, poor cognition and all of these things, those are exactly the symptoms if you've been raped. 
So think, we're bringing up a generation of girls who act as if they've been raped but haven't actually been raped. That's not to belittle what actual rape is, right? Not at all, because which is more traumatic, obviously. So what's happened, and what I see with my students, is that they have capitulated to men's sexual demands. They have given in, and I have to say this, absolutely. They have given in, and one of the reasons, I would say not the only reason, is that we now have a so-called third wave feminism, which is basically feminism light, feminism without politics, which is telling women over and over again that it is empowering to be in the porn culture. That is empowering to be a stripper, it is empowering to have as much sex as you want with men, and the um, feminist movement has totally bought into that ideology. Um, I think talking about the um, culture as perp at large um, really uh, leads to the question of capitalism. and. Uh, first, let's go with how does pornography intersect with the other capitalist industries? I mean, isn't it just like a few pervs who make a lot of money? Oh, if only. Right, no, you've got tons. Of, first of all, let me, I mean, no, it's that basically many, many men now are making a fortune. Um, I went to the um, Porn Expo in Las Vegas, which is where basically 10,000 porn fans descend on this theater and me. Okay, so that was what was a few years ago. And I went to all the workshops. And what is interesting at this porn convention is, of course, not one person in these workshops is talking about sex. They're all talking about money. They're all talking, for example, there was a whole workshop on whether bulk mailing is better than email. Right? This is what they talk about. This is what gets them aroused and excited is the money. So it is absolutely at its core a capitalist industry. It is predatory capitalism. It is out to maximize profits. I'll give you an example. It intersects with um, the credit card company because, of course, now you need to buy pornography over online. You need the credit card. It intersects with the hotel industry. The hotel industry makes about half a billion dollars from porn, more money from porn than the in-room uh, bars. It intersects with the real estate industry in um, uh, California because of what well, it's all out there in the valley. It intersects with the mainstream industry because two of the big distributors of pornography are Comcast and um, at DirecTV, which are owned by major corporations. For example, at one time, the person who made the most money by um, from pornography was any idea? The person who was making the most money was Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch. Right, because he owned um, a company that basically, <coughs> through satellite, was distributing more pornography than any other company. So this is what, how it intersects. Rupert Murdoch, you don't get any more of a predatory capitalist than that. And also what you find when you come and look at it with capitalism is that because they're in bed economically with the mainstream industry, it behooves the mainstream industry to start giving a glamorized image of pornography. And I'll give you an example of this. Oprah Winfrey had on her show Jenna Jameson a few months ago. You all know who Jenna Jameson is? No. Oh, this is probably the only group who doesn't know who Jenna Jameson is. <laughs> <laughs> Jenna Jameson is the first ever porn star in that she is a woman who moves seamlessly from pornography to pop culture and back again. Oprah Winfrey had her on her show. She was literally salivating over Jenna Jameson and how wonderful her life was. She took the cameras to Jenna Jameson's house to show her her private art collection, to show her, this is Oprah Winfrey doing this, right? And how great pornography was. Now think about this. You are watching this. You're a working class girl looking at minimum wage jobs. This looks like a viable alternative because never before has anyone thought being in pornography was a way to make money. But now you have some very cleverly placed porn stars who've made a fortune and what happens is these girls think I can be the next Jenna Jameson. They get on a bus, come over to the valley in their thousands and then what happens to the average girl is that they have a shelf life of three months. The main reason is their body cannot tolerate what happens to them in the pornography. They are lucky if they leave with the clothes on their back and many of them end up in the brothels of Nevada. That's the reality of women in pornography. And Oprah Winfrey gave this hideous representation of it. Now, of course, because everyone's in bed together. So why not glamorize the industry? So let's, let's move to sort of, we were talking before about how it 
affects men's and women's sexuality and self-image, but then sort of in the larger sense, what role does the mass media play in getting people to accept the corporate interests as their own? To getting, because that sort of moves us from a, what do we say, a gender perp role to a, a, all, a all gender perp role. Well, I mean, you know, Marx, if ever you read Marx, what's so amazing about Karl Marx was he could tell the future. I don't know how he did it, but here he was, sitting in the reading room of the British Library, figuring out exactly what was going to happen a few hundred years later. So what he had this model, and Marx's model is that you have to understand that the economic base, i.e. capitalism in this case, determines all the other institutions of society. And the reason they have to do that, for example, the education, the media, the government, um, religion, the reason they have to get control of these institutions is you have to legitimize why 1% of the population owns everything. Because when you think about it, what these people get away with is just astounding. And by the way, it's going to get worse because it's going to be a bumper um, crop for uh, Wall Street when it comes to December and they get the bonuses. They're saying they're going to be biggest bonuses than they've ever got ever in the world. You have to legitimize this ridiculousness. So the role of the media is to legitimize it. And I have to tell you what happened to me yesterday in class. And I've got this fabulous class this semester. They loved my stuff on racism, right? They're all white and we talked about racism from a really radical perspective. They loved the stuff on Marxism. They loved the gender stuff. You know what they fought me on yesterday, tooth and nail? Disney. We did Disney as a corporate predator and they were furious with me. Absolutely furious with me. And I thought, and you know, and that's an example of the role that Disney plays. They said to them, when you attack Disney, you attack my childhood. That's what they said. Which of course is also something else. It's also what happens is that Disney also, I think, represents what Americans would like to think America is. Right? That's really what it is as well, that innocence, you know. So what happens with the media? is it, it basically brainwashes you and it fills your head with trivial things. I say to my students on the first day of class, how many of you know that Brad left Jen for Angela? I presume you don't know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Trust me, Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt. All the hands go up. I said, how many of you know, you know, this, and I go off into all this, you know, ridiculous stuff about all of these celebrities. Then I say, and all the hands are going up, I say, how many know about the Kyoto Agreement? Not one hand goes up. You see, this is what it does. It basically fills your head with total trivia. It also tells you, as we know, that you are what you consume. That without your products, you don't have an identity. And so what culture does in general is it turns people, it commodifies people, and people in turn commodify themselves and construct their identities through the products that they buy. And that's really the role of the media. A couple of things. One of them is, uh, this reminds me of a great line by Henry Adams. Um, how do you say it? Uh, the press is the moneyed agent, the press is the hired agent of a moneyed system and set up for no other reason than to tell lies where the interests are concerned. The hitman. And that's, you can't really say it better than that. No, no, that's perfect. Um, okay, so as long as you're going to go after Disney, um, let's go ahead and go after a different <laughs> sacred cow, which is um, in the 1970s, it used to be really fun to make fun of the uh, Soviet Politburo for being 97% Communist Party members. And you know, they put a bunch of fake elections, there's a bunch of crap, I mean, it's not a democracy. Um, <laughs> but now in the United States, what percentage of the House of Representatives and Senate would you say are capitalist party members? Well, 100%. 100%. I mean, what, and what's interesting is, um, well, let me just say one thing about Russia. You know, when, when Russia uh, became, uh, got rid of communism and the wall came down in Germany, do you know who the first people on the planes were from here to Russia? You Hefner, right? Got the first plane out to take Playboy to Russia. So that's a perfect example. So I mean, I mean this. I mean, there's no such thing as democracy. How can you have democracy in capitalism? You can't have it. Well, a can you say more? Well, yeah, just say more about that, and then I'll come. Okay. Well, I think the best thing I ever saw was anyone heard of Anthony Wedgwood Ben? Very left wing British politician. Yeah. So he was being interviewed by CNN, and it was the usual CNN interview. You know, big hair, big teeth, and blonde hair. And she said to Anthony Benn, she says, now that Russia is no longer communist and is democratic. And he says, no, no, no. He says, Russia's not democratic. 
She says, no, no, no. Now that it's democratic, now that communism's gone. He says, no, it's not. You can't have capitalism and you can't have democracy. And she says, no, 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 we're not connecting here. Because right? she didn't have a framework for understanding what he was saying. So, I mean, and it's exactly right. You cannot have a capitalist economy and democracy. The two, capitalism does not allow democracy. How can it? Because if you allow democracy, real democracy, the average person is going to vote out the elite. And remember, a lot of these people are not themselves wealthy. But you are completely in the hands of these people because you can't afford to vote. You know, I say this to my students. I say, if I want to be president tomorrow, what do I need? And they all say money. So I say, OK, I need lots and lots of money, like $80 million just to start the campaign. Where do I go? So I go to this, I go to the capitalists. So I say, OK, I go to GE. And I go to GE and I say, you know, I really want to run for president. And he's going to say, yes, what can you do for me? And I'm going to say, well, I'm going to put an international tribunal court because you've made more super fun sites than anyone else and you're going on trial. I mean, and then you go to each corporation. Of course, you're not going to get any money. So I say to them, what you know before you even listen to any candidate, without question, is they have been bought. That's it. And I said, and you can vote in GE, GM, or Apple, or you can vote in Disney, or CNN. You choose whichever corporation. But today, actually, it's all the same, because most corporations give exactly the same to each party. They hedge their bets. So it's the same corporations we vote in anyway. So can there be even really considered to be a left when there is not a strong anti-democratic? Can there be a left? Can there be a left? Mm. I mean, there was, I grew up with a left. I do remember when there was a left. I think, <laughs> I do, and I grew up with it. Um, I have to say that as being a radical feminist, I have a very uneasy relationship to the left today, as most of us do. And the first reason is that the left has embraced pornography and refuses to come out against it. And I say in my book, by the way, I say, look, you know, as left-wingers, we have completely agreed that media is a tool of the capitalists, that we completely understand that Fox manipulates and moulds its viewers and seduces them. So why, when we understand that, when we get to por pornography, do we suddenly decide it has no effect? So Fox can manipulate and seduce, but not pornography. That doesn't manipulate and seduce. That's completely different. And what the, the left have done has refused to take on pornography. I wrote an article with Bob Jensen called Why Porn is a Left Issue, and we tried to pitch it to um, the nation. And I called up, and I got one of the editors, and I said, you know, we want to talk about pornography and the left. His first words out of his mouth is, we don't believe in censorship at the nation. I hadn't even mentioned anything, right? Nothing. So he, he said to me, well, what about women-owned porn? This is, this is what they always say, what about women? So I said, well, let me ask you this. If I was a journalist and I was doing an article on capitalist-controlled media, would the nation disprove everything I'm saying? It's the same thing, right? Basically, you have exceptions, you know? And what, but of course, women-owned porn is the exception, and that proves that pornography is feminist and, is an, and all of that, which is his argument. So, I mean, so the left, I have a very difficult relationship to. I think it's very masculinized. I think it's very patriarchal. And um, I think as soon as you've got men in power, women and children are in terrible position. I think in addition, um, I don't really think there's a left because just like with the Senate and the House of Representatives, it's not, I mean, it's not only pro-porn, it's for the most part pro-capitalist. Well, that's all it is. And so I don't think you can have a left that's, that's pro-capitalist either. I mean, because yeah. it's all the same. Um, okay. And it's just, it's, and that's the thing, the reason this is even interesting to talk about, I think, I mean, this part, the reason I keep hammering this is because, um, so in the United States, I mean, if we have a real left being, you know, let's forget, you know, anti-industrial for now, yeah. and just yeah. say, you know, if a left is anti-capitalist, and if a right is proto-fascist, pro-capitalist, then basically the United States really does have a political mainstream of between one and three. That's exactly right. They've wiped out the left wing in this country. So what looks moderate would in Europe, you see, be basically completely different. You know, in, we've just had the Conservatives have been voted in in England, for example, which is awful. But the Conservatives are your Democrats. We don't have Republicans in Europe. 
right? There's no such thing. If somebody stood up in England and started talking about getting rid of welfare and getting rid of the healthcare system, there would be a revolution in the streets. They simply would not tolerate it. So there's no such thing as Republicans. You know, we don't have a new Gingrich, thank God, you know, and nobody would survive because you know why the media on that level go after the politicians, the Guardian, the Independent. But let me tell you what country I grew up in, and it's not great England, but this is what a left looks like. I was a kid and there was a big election coming up, the Conservatives and the Labour Party. And this was when the Labour was really left, okay, not the new Labour of Tony Blair. And they asked the Treasurer, the guy who was going to be the Treasurer of the Labour Party, they said, if you get in, what are you going to do? And this is what he said on national television at six o'clock. He said, if we get in, he says, I am going to squeeze the rich till they squeak. <laughs> and you know what? They got in. Now, could you imagine an America a politician saying that? It would be unthinkable. Yeah, yeah. Um, how are we doing for time? Well, I don't know what you want to do because we're so far over now as the whole day goes. <laughs> um, we're at 2.32. Oh, so we still have a little bit of time, I think. Um, okay, so there's a, a couple, I guess, three, four. Um, a couple, three questions. Um, how do we get, you know, given the power of the, the whole pornographic or capitalistic ideology mm -hmm. in both cases, um, how do we really get people to engage in a, in, a, in a real discussion about their effects? Well... Especially in such a superficial... Absolutely. I mean, it, it is very, very hard because pornography has so colonized the sexual imagination. I mean, it is difficult. But having said that, and I'm sure Lier, who also gives lectures, after a 40-minute lecture, people's eyes are open. I mean, they are really open. So what we need to do, and one of the reasons we started our group, Stop Porn Culture, is we believe we need a grassroots organization to start raising consciousness as to the harms of pornography. And one of the things that we did is we put together a slideshow, which has 100 slides and a 50-minute script, which we give out free of charge that you can download from stoppornculture.com and you can give it in your communities. So that was the main thing was to do, was to start um, doing that. What we need to do is we need to subvert the, the dominant hegemony around sexuality. And it is very, very hard because we don't have access to the mass media. And so I think the only way to go is to try and treat this as a public health issue. You attack it as you would attack any other public health issue. But I'll tell you the truth, unless we have a movement, this gene is not going back in the bottle. You know, you can't put this genie back in that bottle. And the other thing I'm really thinking about seriously is that, you know, we have an untapped resource out there, especially for the pornography activists, and that's mothers, right? We have to start organizing mothers because what happens is the right wing come in and do that, right? They get to them before we do. And then many women are very concerned about their children being brought up in a porn culture, so we need to politicize these women. Instead of thinking, because you know what? We always blame parents. And in a patriarchal culture, when you blame parents, you blame your mothers. It's all your fault, right? What can they do? They're overwhelmed. So I think we need to start building a movement as well based on the power of mothers. And how does that apply to uh, wrestling back our culture from corporate predators? I mean, well, do we also address that as a, as a, as a um, public health issue? And do we also address that through mothers? I mean, I don't... No, no, and when I say mothers, I mean all women as well, I'm not just excluding yeah, yeah, yeah. mothers. No, no, that's going to take more than this. I mean, the truth is, though, ultimately, you know, we talk about what we're going to do about corporations. You know, we're going to have to do something because the planet, as we've talked about, isn't going to sustain this. I mean, we are not, we cannot carry on as we carry on. We cannot consume. I mean, what really makes it interesting, you know, we talk about is the recession over, you know, ridiculous. And they talk about growth, as if growth is a good thing. You know, that's what we always want to measure in growth, growth, growth. You know, what do they think that we can carry on doing this? So I think what we need to be talking about is developing what <coughs> ideas about how we can have a life once this economic collapse does come, because we are going to have to do that. We have to start thinking about post that, because we're not going to overthrow capitalism now. Right? The, the basically environmental disasters that are coming, I think we need to harness and to overthrow capitalism. So two questions. Um, uh, the first one is, why does a real resistance movement need a radical feminist analysis? And I want to I say actually one thing about that yeah. first, which is that um, you were talking about economic collapse, and I talk a lot about industrial collapse, yeah. and um, just yesterday I was interviewed by Amy Goodman, and one of the things that she asked me was about collapse, and 
Um, I said one of the things I always say, which is that when a patriarchal civil society collapses, if you want to see what happens, look at the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. yeah. That rapes will become more prevalent, even more prevalent, I should say, Absolutely. and more organized. And the reason I'm bringing all this up is because my response to that impending part of the collapse is I believe in two things. One is uh, I really like Andrea Dworkin's line about my prayer for women of the 21st century is uh, harden your hearts and learn to kill. Mm -hmm. Which in this case means case of <coughs> self-defense. Mm -hmm. And for men, um, <coughs> what I've thought about this is that we need to make our allegiance to the victims of male violence absolute. And the point of me bringing all this up having to do with, you know, sort of me answering the question before you answer the question, you know, why does the real resistance movement need a real feminist analysis is because real resistance in this case means collapse of capitalism, which means chaos, yeah. which means probably increased rapes, which means we need to prepare for that now yeah. is part of the reason. The, 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 the time to make the allegiance to women absolute is now and not. Yeah. Anyway, so that's my response to that. What is your response well, to? Well, the same thing. I would say the same thing. First of all, well, when I talk about collapse, I'm sure most of you agree, we're also looking at cultural collapse. Right? The culture cannot sustain this level of pornography. And when you talk about that, you know, when, when these things do get out of hand and the men do run amok, these are going to be men who've been brought up on hardcore pornography. So look, how amok, look what they're going to do. I think women are going to have to start protecting themselves and figure out ways in which we can protect ourselves because I think men, you know, the Congo to me is a perfect example of what happens with masculinity when a mug. That's what men will do. If they get license to do it, that's what they will do. And I don't know if, pe I'm sure people know what's going on in the Congo. I mean, it's not just rape, it's the intense sexual torture of these women. Um, so we need to start protecting ourselves. And we need to find men of good faith to help us, you know. I mean, there's not that many, unfortunately, you know. There's, but we need those that are, we need to find them. So the last question is, um, why do we have an anti-porn activist at an Earth at Risk conference? Um, I, w I, w that was one, I was asking myself that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, because you know what? It's the culture of sadism. And sadism is what's fueling all of this. And what we do, I think, is we let the, you know, the trouble with patriarchy is not just that men rule it but that men have this ability to let the worst of men get to the top. That's what the trouble is with it. And that's true of corporations, it's true when it comes to pornography. So, I mean, would I, what was your question again? Why, why would we have an anti-porn activist at, as a conference? At yes, a I say because it's safe. What's the relationship between <coughs> The pornographication of women and the pornographication of the world. What? How? Well, I think Jay put it really well. That concept of ownership, that concept of commodification. What you do to women, what you do to the earth and animals, you'll always do to women as well. I mean, it's that whole idea that circulates in our culture. And I think that, to be honest with you, you know, we need to realize one of the things is if those of us are here realizing, you know, we're going to have to change the way we do business because it's certainly not going to work. We need to have a radical feminist analysis in that because who the I was going to say who the fuck, I'm sorry. <laughs> who the hell wants to, wants to recreate this mess? I mean, and what we, what, if anything it tells us is you've got to have women front and centre. You don't have women front and centre, you have a patriarchal, capitalist, <coughs> racist, imperialist mess, you know? And what I always say ultimately, you know what women do? We clean up. I'm so sick of cleaning up after men. You know, you clean up their houses, we wash their underpants, and now we clean up the world after they've left a mess. And I say to women, we have to stop cleaning up. You know, enough we're cleaning up already. We need to get some control. And if we don't, then women and children live in disastrous situations. So what I would say in the end is, you know what, you men, you did it, you screwed up, sit back, give us a chance, you know. Yeah. <laughs>